Good evening, Ryan. Ryan, are we go? Yeah, you can go ahead. Right. Thank you very much to the whole SciFest team for making this webinar possible. This webinar is part of the uh, overall theme of the International Year of Plant Health. And the sub theme in February is Indigenous Knowledge Systems. And we're very pleased to welcome as our webinar presenter this evening, Dr. Leslie Ansley, who has a PhD from UCT and initially worked in the sports sciences field in which he published over 50 papers. He then moved to the UK where he worked for a while in online identity before returning to South Africa um, where he started a whole new adventure in life in making craft gins from a very unusual, or at least flavoring them from a very unusual source. Um, he also has mentioned to us that he's very proud to own Joe, an American quarter horse, and I hope we'll hear more about Joe as well. And Leslie is talking to us from Paul. I'd like to invite all participants, both on Zoom and on Facebook, to post your questions in the chat box and we will try to answer them uh, later on um, in the webinar. So before we ask um, Leslie Ainsley to present his presentation, I'm gonna make a few introductory comments. Now in the Northern Hemisphere, gin is made by distilling fermented grain mash, usually from wheat or barley, in a process similar to the production of whiskey and vodka. But in Africa, we do things differently. Here, gin is traditionally produced from fermented sugarcane or sugar rather than grains, which are twice as expensive locally. We also use molasses, grape, and other agricultural products. But we need to remember that gin consists essentially of two components. One of them is the fermenter, which I've discussed, and the other is the flavorant, which is often also the colorant. In fact, gin is a spirit that is defined by and famous for the botanicals or plant extracts that are used to flavor and color it. Many uh, botanicals are used to flavor craft gin, which is why it's relevant to this SciFest uh, theme of plant health. And this is where the ingenuity and the daring of the distillers and the entrepreneurs comes in. To be classified as gin, the spirit must have some juniper in it, which is where the pine taste comes from. But other than that, gin distillers are free to choose their botanicals at will. That freedom makes gin one of the most diverse liquors in the, on the market, as distillers distinguish themselves by using various levels of varying levels of one botanical or another, as well as by adding plants, extracts, and herbs taken from local sources. So in that sense, gin often speaks to a certain place. In addition to the primary ingredient of juniper, which is added with a whisper or a wallop, botanicals that flavor gin most often include spices such as coriander, cardamom, anise, cinnamon, flowers such as rose and lavender, bark such as cassia, roots, angelica or orris, and citrus peel, typically lemon uh, or grapefruit. Now, of course, in Africa, we have a huge range of plants to call on as flavorants and colorants for our craft gins. And in particular around Cape Town, the Cape Floral Kingdom, though the smallest, is the most biodiverse plant kingdom in the world and can be experienced in a glass by drinking, for instance, Valdera Feinbos gin, distilled from sugarcane but flavored with Cape Feinbos botanicals. And many of our local gins have undertones, for instance, of citrus and aftertaste provided by many Feinbos botanicals. Now let's go over to the amazing adventure of Ndluvu or gin uh, flavored with elephant dung. Now I gather Glessy at the background to this and I hope we'll learn more about it, is that one day your wife, a biologist, asked you a strange question. Would it be possible to make gin from elephant dung? After all, elephants browse selectively on a range of botanicals, yet they, yet they absorb less than half of what they eat, with the result that much of their food, roots, leaves, fruits, and bark, remains in the dung. So you reckon that you should let elephants do the hard work by collecting the range of natural ingredients that could be used to flavor and, and, and color gin, and you would do the distilling. 
After all, elephant dung is used all over Africa and has been for centuries uh, to make traditional medicine and tea. So Leslie, um, I've got lots of questions to ask you along the way and at the end, but we'd now like to, you to uh, invite you to give your presentation and then we'll continue with questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Mike. That was a, uh, a very uh, thorough introduction. Um, I'm not sure I've got much to add now. Um, so absolutely. So uh, hi, everyone. I'm Les Ansley. I uh, and uh, my wife and I, we make uh, in low gin. And during this presentation, I'm going to not, not focus so much on the actual distillation process. Um, what I thought I might do is uh, talk to you about how science actually informed our adventure into, into this field um, and how, how our background as, as research scientists led us, led us this way and, and, and helped us get to where we, where we are. Um, so, and, and then also some, hopefully some interesting anecdotes along the way about some obstacles and, and difficulties which you might imagine that we uh, we encountered and and perhaps how we how we overcame them or how we're dealing with them uh, as we go along so i um i've got a presentation so I'll, i'm going to uh, talk you through it um there is a there is a um i think this is there is a link there we go at the a bitly link um, at the bottom there, so you are able to um, follow along if you want on your on your own laptop. Uh, alternatively, you can uh, you can just watch my screen. So I've entitled this uh, presentation: If you're going to make a gin from elephant dung, you can't make a gin that stinks. Uh, and this is really the crux. This was the crux for us right from the beginning. Uh, is that we did not want to make a a what, what's the word a a, a joke gin or, or a, a, some sort of fly by night product. We wanted we and we felt that we could make a very good product with a long lasting product and something that perhaps had a legacy. Um, and and you'll see that in a in a moment. So that's that's myself and and Paula, my wife, and we uh, we. As Mike mentioned, we'd been in the UK for 17 years prior to, to moving back here in 2017. Uh, and we moved back um, because we felt there were possibilities here and opportunities to actually make a difference, which was a little bit lacking perhaps in, in, the, in the UK. Um, and we, so we brought our two, two kids out uh, to, to experience Africa. And I guess... The question is, how did we get from, from there to where we are? So my wife, uh, her research area was in chronic fatigue. Um, and, and you'll notice that, or you'll, you'll see that our background really is, is questioning, and that's a science background. So Paula did a, she, she proposed her own hypothesis, uh, which is looking at um, interleukin-6 as, as in, in fatigue. And actually, that's now becoming very, very relevant now with this post-viral fatigue from COVID. Um, and it looks like it's very much linked to the work that she was doing all those years ago. So Paula was very used to coming up with ideas, the hypotheses, and, and seeing, really, and testing them. Um, and she, years and years ago, when we lived in South Africa, uh, around um, 1998, 1999, she actually... Uh, partnered with a pharmaceutical company here, uh, or a, or a um, supplements part uh, uh, company in South Africa, uh, Farm, Farm Natura, and developed a supplement to boost your immune system or to boost boost immune system for athletes so that they did not succumb to the coughs and colds before events. So she's very used to looking at the science or, or coming up with an idea, looking at the science, and then following that through to its conclusion uh, in the commercial world or, or as, a, as a product. Um, and likewise, I, although my field was slightly different in research, I looked at um, exercise-induced asthma in athletes. It was still very similar in that you're exploring 
you're exploring things, you, you, you're looking at links and you, you're looking perhaps at the missing bits. So it's almost looking at a, a, a puzzle and you, it's not that you see everything that's there, you see what's not there. And then you start exploring and unpicking that uh, and, and hypothesizing. Um, and then, uh, so that, that's really our, our background. So there's Paula and, and Paula went from being a research scientist uh, to a to a photographer so for a while she 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 was a professor at uh, university of northumbria uh, and then she decided that she would pursue photography and then how do you go from that to elephant dung and in my in my uh in my case i went from uh i was a reader which is uh, i think equivalent position in south africa would be an associate professor uh, and then I moved across into online identity where I looked after the UK government's verify or two, two of the partners in the UK uh, verify scheme, which was trying to get everyone to do everything online. To this, how, what was the pathway and how did we, how did we follow it? The idea came like most good ideas actually um crept up on us so when we moved back to south africa we moved back to south africa in september 2017 and about a week or two after we moved back here paula met went and met her mom in kenya um, her mom had organized a, a safari trip in kenya and invited paula along and so she flew up there and they spent uh, i think it was uh, 10 days going around kenya and it was while she was up there and most evenings they would sit around water holes and they would sip gin and tonics and just really watch the sunset on Africa and, and soak up the, soak up that uh, environment. And then when she came back to, back down to South Africa after this trip, uh, a couple of months later, we took Carrie and Amelia and these are my two youngsters. We took them on their first ever safari. So we went to Botliaskop in the Eastern Cape and we, we explored nature with them and they loved it. Uh, and it was while we were on this safari that we went for a, a walk with one of the game rangers and he took us, he was an amazing character and he, he knew so much about the, the bush and he was explaining um, how, how, what various animals ate and their, their patterns of, of migration, etc. And then he started talking about the elephants and he was telling us how these massive animals, four and a half ton animals, their primary role is bush clearance. That's what they are in the environment. They clear the bush. And in order to do so, and in order to make them effective and efficient, they need a very low, or they have a very low absorption, gastroabsorption. So when they eat, they're two or 300 kilos of, of food a day, they actually only absorb about 30%. And the, the, the other 70% is untouched and ends up on the felt floor. And this is, this is very, very important, as well as the, the bush clearance, that elephant dung is very, very important into, to the environment uh, for various birds, the dung beetle. Uh, so all sorts of wildlife also uh, benefit from this. But it does mean that these, these huge creatures need to eat between 15 and 20 hours a day. And so they do a huge amount of eating um, and, and yet very, very little uh, absorption. They are also non-fermenters. So they don't, nothing gets fermented. It's not like a cow where they ruminate. So they're non-ruminants uh, and they have, they have actually a, a very, um, fairly quick gut transit time of, of under 24 hours. Um, and they have very low gut bacteria. So in, in the bush, if you're very thirsty or you, and, you, and you need water and you come across fresh elephant dung, you can, if you've watched, um, that's a um, the head of scouts, uh, no, come to me in a moment, you'll, you'll, you can pick up the elephant dung, you can squeeze it and you can drink the liquid, liquid straight out of it as a survival technique. Uh, elephant dung is also used uh, and brewed in, in as, as Mike alluded to, 
in Africa and is brewed as a, a pain medicine and given to, to women in childbirth. It's inhaled, so it's burnt, and the smoke is inhaled to clear headaches and sinuses as well. So it's used in, in all variety of, of um, medicines up in, the, up in Africa. So we had these two, well, Paula had these two experiences. She had that experience up in Kenya where she was sitting around water holes. And then she had that, that, those nuggets of information that the game ranger managed to, to plant in or seed in her mind. Um, and so the, this, our visit to, uh, to Botlias Corp was around January or February time. Although it looks a bit colder here, it was a very seasonally um, odd. And about, I must have been four or six weeks later, I had this jab in my back at about six o'clock in the morning. And I turned over and I said, what's up? And, and Paula says, do you think we could make gin from elephant dung? And I think it was probably our science background where you don't dismiss ideas straight away. Um, so instead of saying to her, oh, don't be ridiculous, go back to sleep and have another dream. Um, it, it was a case of, I'd, I'd looked at it and I said, well, let's explore it. Let's see whether we can see whether we can do this. Um, and so this idea suddenly turned into a research question. And we followed then the same principles as we had our entire science life. And so the research question is, can you make gin from elephant dung? And your hypothesis, of course, is elephant can elephant can, dung can be used in the making of gin. And then our null hypothesis is it cannot be used. And, um, and so we kind of uh, adopted this approach. And there are a lot of things that we needed to to explore because of course this is not something we we knew anything about we we did not come from a, a gin making background we weren't in the beverage industry we knew what most people knew about wildlife in in south africa not uh, not a heap more um and so there are a lot of things we needed to find out one is is first of all do elephants eat anything poisonous um, because if an elephant eats something poisonous to us, then that would be very likely that we wouldn't be able to, to make dung, uh, gin from elephant dung. Um, how can we source um, elephant dung? Um, things like, um, how do you make gin? That was, that was a very early question. Is okay, well, maybe we can, but let's find out how you make gin in order to, to see whether we can do this. So we had a we had a, a number of questions that we needed to explore um, in, in order to, oh, well, before we could actually um, take this any further. And so we went back to school and we went right to the start of, okay, how do we make alcohol? And then how do we make gin in particular? Uh, and we went on a, we, uh, this is a, a course that's run by Distalique. Uh, and we went right back to, to first principles so that nothing was black box. Because again, this is something that we both learned during our lecturing years. You want to understand from first principles. Uh, otherwise, you will come up un unstuck at some point uh, if, you, if you don't un understand those fundamentals. So we had our, our classroom uh, and we had our mentor. And this is George, uh, this isn't George, this is Roger Jorgensen. And Roger was, is an amazing character. So to take you back a little bit, once we had this idea and we spoke to friends about it and, um, and said, you know, this is what we're perhaps thinking. One of our friends said, well, you need to speak to Roger. He's a friend of ours and he is an amazing character and, and you need to go and speak to him about this idea. And to give you some background on Roger, he started Jorgensen Gins and he is probably the grandfather of craft gin in South Africa. And his knowledge of botanicals is second to none. And um, so we thought, okay, well, let's go, and, let's go and speak to him, perhaps. But then, of course, you're worried about being ridiculed. Um, and you, you're concerned that, you know, you're going to put this out there because this is an idea you have. And you, you're concerned you're going to put this out here, out there. 
and and you're going to get laughed at uh, or he's going to say don't be ridiculous that's uh, that's a terrible idea so there's this hesitation so we we've done all the all the groundwork we've gone to the classes we we found out what elephants ate uh, and and found that there wasn't uh, there was nothing poisonous in there uh, we found out far more about their digestive system than we we knew before and we'd also contacted Botlias Corp uh, and we said hi we stayed with you guys a few months back had a lovely time would you mind sending us some elephant dung in the post and this is why I came back to Africa is because there was no question of what well, that's the most ridiculous thing ever it was certainly how would you like it mailed to you um, and uh, and so we, we were the proud recipients of a postnet box or parcel uh, filled with elephant dungs and labeled botanicals. And so we had these, these botanicals and we'd, or we'd had the elephant dung and we got the raw elephant dung and we think, okay, well now what do we do with it? And I'm not sure how closely you've, you've inspected elephant dung before, uh, when you see it in the, in the game in the game drives, it's usually quite straw-like. Uh, but when it's fresh, it contains a lot of dirt because the elephants dig up roots as well. Uh, and they eat small stones and all sorts. And so you get a, a lot of this dirt uh, within it. And so we started experimenting with various washing methods. What's the best way to get um, the dirt out and separate the botanicals? Uh, and in this process, we uh, one of our one of our early experiments, we actually managed to break our washing machine because we had them in a pillowcase, and we thought, "Why well, we'll put it all in a pillowcase, and we'll tie the pillowcase, and we we'll put it in the washing machine, and and put it on a rinse cycle, and see what happens." Uh, only we we didn't tie it up tight enough, and the the batch of elephant dung that we put in got out, and we heard this. I was sitting in the in the living room, and I heard this terrible grating noise going on the, in the kitchen. I thought that doesn't sound great. And I dashed into the kitchen and there was just water all over the floor. Uh, and we'd, uh, we'd, <laughs> we'd done, in our, done in our washing machine. But uh, through various trial and, and error methods, we, we came to a very uh, efficient uh, method of, of cleaning the elephant dung. So we had this amazing um, botanicals uh, available and we it was sitting there for ages and we're thinking do we go to Roger don't we go to Roger how do we play this anyway one one day one of Paula's friends said right I'm sick and tired of you equivocating let's go to Roger now and so she dragged Paula by the hand with this with this bag of elephant dung and uh, and took her across to Roger and they were sitting out in Roger's garden and all Paula said to him is Roger we just want to know whether we can make gin from these botanicals and Roger Roger took the botanicals from her and he, he smelt them and then he started eating them and tasting them. And he looks at them and goes, absolutely, what, what is it? And, and Paula said, it's elephant dung. And uh, she says his, his face just lit up because he's such, a, he's such a quirky character. He goes, that's amazing, I love it, let's do it. And so Roger has really mentored us through this whole process, which has been, um, I mean, so, so helpful for us. Um, and, and, you know, helped us with the recipes and, and held our hand through, through the early days. Um, so we, we've got a lot to, to thank Roger for. And, and this is another point I think that comes back to science is that science traditionally has mentors. You have a mentor. You have, when you're doing your undergrad, you have your lecturer. When you're doing your postgrad, you have your supervisors. Uh, and then when, you're, uh, when you go up into research then you have the lead researcher or the principal researcher, and it's these, these people who guide you through uh, the, the process until you become confident and knowledgeable in it. And, and that's exactly what Roger did for us. So he became almost our, our, our science guide through, the, through this process. And uh, as I say, we, we owe so much to him. So in the process, Paula and I gave up our laboratories, our, our sports science laboratories and our biochemistry laboratories. Uh, but we entered a new laboratory, and this is our little home still. 
Um, and <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a small one, uh, not a commercial one at all. Uh, so, and this is where a lot of experimentation takes place. Um, and as, as Mike said, gin is, is basically uh, is fermented from in South Africa from sugarcane or molasses. Uh, and then you've got various, you've got various ways of flavoring it. And, and one of the indirect methods of, of flavoring it is through the still. So you put your, your base uh, spirit in the, in the still, you heat it up. And then in that bag, you see that bag halfway up, there is, uh, you put your botanicals. So your juniper, your orris root, your, uh, uh, your angelica, your citrus rind, wh whatever flavorings you want to add to the gin. And then you heat the, the, the alcohol up uh, and it rises up through the, um, through the botanicals and it draws the flavors. And then it starts cooling, condensing, and then it runs down into the condenser and then comes out as, as alcohol. Uh, well, as gin. And it, gin in this country, by definition, needs to be juniper forward. And by that, they mean that when you, when you drink gin, your first taste that you have should be juniper. And when you, when you smell gin, it should be, there should be a, a, a strong juniper uh, nose to, to, the, um, to the drink as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a juniper, they call it juniper forward. And so this became our new, um, our new laboratory. And this is where the different flavors and, and, and techniques uh, happen. So that's one. So the, the, that's the, the indirect method. The, the direct method of, um, of flavoring gin is where you get um, the, the liquid uh, and then you put your, your botanicals or your flavorings into a bag and you immerse it into the, the, into the alcohol or the, the base spirit and you leave it to macerate. So a bit, a bit like a tea bag, I guess, is the is a, is a closest example. And you can leave it there for any length of time, a day, two days, three days. And then you take that out and then the, the alcohol would have leached the flavors uh, and, the, and then some of the colorants out of the, out of the botanicals uh, and then that'll uh, inform your gin flavor. So those are, those are the two primary methods, the direct and the indirect method. For our gin, so this is in Glover gin, and, and just, uh, just a few things. We, as well as exploring the gin, we explored the branding um, as well. And this is important. I, so this is, I think, where science and business comes together. Is that in Glovu, in, in many African languages, means elephant. Um, and so we, and that, and that diagram of, of the elephant is a, an old Zulu finger painting uh, depiction of, of elephants. Ibu, um, uh, the, 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 the name of the company, so Inglovu is a brand and Ibu is a company that we formed. Ibu Ngani means dung beetle and Ibu means story or note. And so we have the story of the dung beetle. Uh, which is uh, which is told through in global gin, uh, and if you look at the, the crest above the ibu, uh, that is the crest of a dung beetle. When you look at it head on, so we what we try to do uh, with with the the whole gin is is really build a story around it. Um, we're also very passionate, and this is where I was talking about earlier about making a difference. We we came back to, to Africa, not, not to just to say we wanted to contribute. And what, one of the ways that we, we contribute back is through, uh, through the gin. And actually 15% of our profits, we donate to wildlife conservation. And we, we donate now to, to the Footsprate uh, Elephant Rehabilitation um, and Development Fund. And they have set up the first elephant orphanage in South Africa. And so our, our profits... Uh, or, or, well, we did 15% of those go to there in order to contribute back. And we see it as a, a, a very nice virtuous circle where the elephants provide us with the, the botanicals uh, and we take those botanicals and make the gin, we sell the gin and, and the money that we make from gin, we put back into elephants who then provide the botanicals. And so we have this little virtuous circle going, uh, going on 
Um, so that's really the, the making of the, of the the science behind it and how we we came to make it. So really, it started out as a can we do this? Um, and we got to a point where it was like, yes, we can. So you start thinking, okay, do we want to do this? Uh, I guess is the next thing. Um, and Paul and I, neither of us had been um, in business before, but we both run entrepreneurial um, uh, projects previously. We both run large research projects before, so we we were familiar with um, you know the logistics involved in in organisation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and we decided we we're going to take the plunge and actually start producing it in a commercial. Uh, in a commercial way, and we were uh, we we're again slightly concerned because we we had we had a lot of positive support, but we'd also speak to people and we go we'd say to them we're making elephant dung gin, and we'd just get people looking at us going well that's disgusting, um, and, and so you start becoming a little bit concerned about who you, who you tell it to and how it's going to be received, and and once you've made something. It turns out the making of it is quite easy. Um, it's the selling of it that's not so easy, because we and and now we've changed our production process now because uh, we it's scaled up a little bit. But at that time, we were doing it just Paula and myself by hand. We were we we're doing the entire process and, and all the bottling. So you can imagine we had a a pallet of a thousand bottles arriving. We had to make the gin for the thousand bottles, and then we had to hand fill and seal and box uh, and pallet uh, a thousand bottles. And it's extremely time consuming. And in fact, it was even worse with the minis. We had 4,000 minis, those 50 mil minis, uh, and they each had to be syringe filled. And so we, that took days and days and days. And again, each one sealed and, uh, and, and boxed. So you've done all this work and you've got all this stock uh, and then you start turning your, your mind to, to, to selling it. Um, and, uh, and so you start calling people and it's just cold calling and it's, it's fairly um, soul destroying in, in, at, at times. Um, you get a lot of people not replying to stuff and, and the like. But one of our very first calls we made was to, uh, we got the telephone number of, um, the lady up at uh, Big Five Duty Free, and I uh, I called her and I, I started my spiel about hi, you know we make a very unusual gin, very African centric, blah blah blah, and uh, she's she's very curt. She says uh, uh, Helena was her name is it is her name. She she says to me ah, stop you there. She says send me an email. If I like it, I'll call you back. I was like okay so i quickly sent her an email outlining what we do and and you know how it's what it's made from and and how tourists will love it etc and i email her and she gets back to me um a little bit later and she says i have um i have an available meeting spot with you tomorrow at 10 o'clock i'll meet you then and i was like, oh brilliant brilliant ah i'm in cape town and she's in Joburg. And, uh, and so I was onto, onto the airlines. Can I get up to Joburg tomorrow flights? Yep. So I arrive and I flew up and I, I landed about half an hour before I met with her because they, they were they housed in, in uh, Oliver Tambo airport. And, and I went in there and I chatted to her and she was as brusque in person as she was on the telephone, but um, it was positive. It came out there. Uh, I think the meeting lasted about five minutes, maybe less. And she goes, "We'll try it," and that was that. And so we, uh, I flew flew home on almost on the on the next flight. So Big Five Duty Free was a really big one for us because it it meant that we could now promote it when we went to other people as well. Um, but to take a step backwards, uh, again, just in terms of the 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 business side of 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 commercializing an idea, I guess, and I think this is an important aspect: is that in science there are a lot of ideas, 
uh, and people are always doing the studies and, and looking at things. Um, but we are inherently quite poor, I think, at c one, communicating our ideas or our research to the general public uh, and, 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 and certainly getting across the importance of it, and two, commercializing the ideas. Uh, because most scientists don't get in, in, into science for the business side of it. They get into it because they love the science, they love the experimentation, they love the research, they love the, you know, the, the scientific paradigm. And, uh, but, but I've found, so, and certainly that's why I got into science, but I must say that I found that I, I really enjoy the business side of it as well now. And, and one of the things that we found when we were, um, when we were looking through this, I talked to you about the, the branding of the product, is bottles. And we found our, our big bottles, our 750 ml bottles, and we liked those almost immediately. Those are the ones for us. And, and then we started looking for minis, and um, we, we couldn't find any. Um, really, we went everywhere, and we could not find a nice-looking mini. And eventually, we went to uh, Bond Pack down in Cape Town, and uh, they got these walls in, in, their, in, their work, in their workroom, and, or their showroom, rather, and one's got medicinal bottles, one's got uh, spirit bottles, one's got beer bottles, one's got medicine bottles, one's got perfume bottles. Um, and uh, I was looking through the, the spirits bottles and I couldn't see anything. And then, um, then I happened to glance across at, at the, the perfume bottles and they had some beautiful shapes. And I was thinking, I wonder why, I wonder if I, we could use perfume, you know, or one of those bottles. But now I, I, I wasn't sure whether there was a reason that they were perfume bottles. So maybe some sort of regulation in terms of the thickness of the bottle or this, uh, I wasn't sure. So I went up to the, uh, the lady behind the counter and I said, excuse me, um, is there any reason I could not put alcohol in, in this bottle? And I showed her a perfume bottle and she looks at it and she goes, yes. I went, oh, and she goes, it's a perfume bottle. I said, well, I know that. I, I said, I'm aware of that, I, but is there, is there a reason? Is there a, 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 some sort of um, legislation or rules that prevents me doing this? And she just looks at me and goes, it's a perfume bottle. And I said, I, well, I know, I know. I said, but if I put alcohol in it, it becomes an alcohol bottle. And she said, well, no one will buy it. And I said, what, what do you mean? She goes, well, it's in a perfume bottle. <laughs> And so this was going around in circles. And eventually, uh, eventually I said, look, I, I, I think I'll take them. Um, and that's how, we, that's how we, we, got our first, we got our first minis uh, in, in the perfume bottle. But it was, uh, it was an interesting way of, uh, of, it was interesting seeing how fixed perceptions are uh, about certain things. Uh, and perhaps that's, you know, there's something scientists, there's scientists we need to always strive to, to do is not get into a, a fixed mindset uh, type or, or fixed paradigm. So, uh, as I alluded to right at the beginning of, of, of the presentation is that if you're going to make a gin from elephant dung, you can't make a bad gin because you will get ridiculed and you'll get laughed out. So we, we entered the South African Craft Gin Awards in 2019 and we put our gin in and um, we waited months for the results. And we went to the awards dinner. Um, so this was pre-COVID time. So you allowed gatherings and it was held down at the um, Mount Nelson Hotel down in, in Cape Town. It was a lovely, lovely awards dinner sponsored by Checkers. And we got uh, a double gold. And as Paula said, this was this was, she was prouder of, of, of receiving that double gold certificate than she was of her PhD certificate. She, she was almost in tears up on the stage. Uh, and, and I think this was a validation of the work that we'd, we'd done, um, you know, and, and the research that we'd done in getting to this point um, and, and the care we'd taken. Uh, and I think this, again, is, is, can be explained really by the methodological process we adopted when we first started out. Um, and, and again, that is, I, I give up, sorry, I 
<clears throat> pass that all over to um, our, uh, our training as, as research scientists. We also uh, got the most compelling foodie story um, for, from the world travel market. Um, unfortunately, this was during COVID, and so we weren't able to go to the uh, awards event. Um, so it's been a, it's been a, it's been an incredible journey, um, and we launched our well. We've bottled our first gin in November two thousand and eighteen. Um, and in that time, we have won double gold at the world uh, at the South African Health Gin Awards, uh, and we've we've been given a, a um, most compelling foodie story. We've also been all over the world in terms of media. Uh, we have I've talked on numerous international radio stations, on local radio stations. We've been in local press, international press. Um, so we, we've really we've got, got a pound of flesh in terms of in terms of uh, marketing, but I think this comes down to and again, this is this is the science I think identifying a novel area, a novel question, and really exploring it, picking it apart, and and presenting it, um, and. I, I mentioned earlier that researchers are traditionally very bad in, in getting it across to the, the public what the importance of their research is. And I think this is why it's so important. You know, if you, if you come up with a research question and you do the research on it um, and you are able to present it in a, in a way that captivates imaginations or makes a talking point, and it's not always a good talking point. I mean, we've, we've had some <laughs> some very uh, uh, scathing um, articles, um, but it creates talking points. Uh, and then people pick it up and they start, you know, discussing it. And it, it's, it's then starts to run on its own. And I think that's why being able to present your science, not only at scientific conferences, but to the general public in, in a consumable way is, is vitally important. Um, in the, in the, when, when we're in the UK, there's a, there's a big research uh, assessment exercise held every four years, five years, I think, I can't remember now, four or five years, uh, where every university in the UK is, is evaluated, their, their research is evaluated, and that, the outcome of that determines their funding, their, their research funding for the next four or five year cycle. Um, and one of the biggest weightings in that is what have they done with that research? All very well, or fine and well doing the research, but has it had an impact? Um, how impactful has it been on, on the public's life, you know, on, on, on outside of an academic's um, surrounding or environment? Um, and I, I hope that that's something that we've we've managed to achieve with ours is that it's it's been fun but we've also given something to people to talk about uh to to enjoy uh and then we we contribute back to conservation so i like i like to think that we we have some impact with with our with our research and now our commercialization of that research and then we move on to um more recently, we, we've launched two new gyms. And this is important, I think, perhaps, well, I guess it, there's, a, there's a, a bit of a moral here, just in terms of both um, research field and also um, business. So when we, when, we, uh, when we launched our gym, one of the big things in the gym world was suddenly pink gyms, was everywhere. And, and our, distrib our distributor said, right, guys, we need, we need a pink gym. We need, we need a strawberry gym. And uh, we're like, oh, we, we do? Really? Um, why? And he was saying, this is a, you know, people love pink gins, strawberry is going to be great, and love your strawberry. And uh, it was Paula. Paula just put her foot down and said, we are not ever going to do a strawberry gin. She said, it's got nothing to do with what we've built up, nothing to do with our previous research in, into the elephants, nothing, you know, it would be like just throwing everything out. And, um, and so we started from research. Uh, we, we went right back to the beginning and said, okay, 
what can we do? It's not going to be strawberry. It's definitely not going to be strawberry. Well, what could we do? And so we went back to, to all our research on elephants, looking at what we eat, what they eat. And we, you know, one of the ingredients was prickly pear. And we thought, well, that'd be amazing. There's no other prickly pear gin. Um, and so we went right back, started researching this, how to get prickly pear in, into gin. Uh, this gin does not contain elephant dung, but we, it contains one of their favorite foods, um, which is prickly pear. And we did exactly the same for our next one, which was oranges and marula. So what we've tried to do is keep a cohesive story together. Um, and this, again, harks back to research. When you're a researcher, when you're a scientist, is try and develop a theme or a continuity within your research. Um, it's, it builds your own career as well, uh, but it also gives you progression. You know, if you're dropping from here to here to here to here and doing all various um, side projects that you, you're not developing a coherent research story. Uh, and that's what we, that's what we hope we've, we've done. But <laughs> this is our timeline for our, our launch of, of our two new expressions. Uh, 28th of February, we launched in Lovey Pink. Uh, and a month later, we have the alcohol ban, which is great. So <laughs> that, that went nowhere. Uh, 1st of June, the, uh, the ban got lifted, woohoo! And the 12th of June, it was reinstated. Uh, 15th of August, is lifted, woohoo! And we thought, fantastic, right, now we can go. We've got the pink. During this time that we were uh, under lockdown, we didn't, uh, we didn't go and, we decided not to go and do gels, or, you know, the hand sanitizers, et cetera, et cetera. What we did do, actually, was we teamed up with uh, local um, food agencies and and did um, food drops at at um, some some of the local townships and, and settlements around us, um, and we're very very thankful for for various uh, Springbok players actually who who helped us out with those. Um, so we we launched our next gin citrus on the twenty eighth of November, thinking fantastic, what can possibly go wrong? Just in time for December, boom! A month later we had uh, about uh, another alcohol ban uh, which only got lifted then on the on the first of february so we are not you'll be pleased to hear not going to be releasing any more expressions and so i suspect we will not be getting any more uh, alcohol bans so those are those are our three those are our three gins the the, the original the citrus and and our pink and our We've been very fortunate with our distributor. We're now right across uh, the country. We're also in Germany, Belgium, um, Japan. Um, we're looking to get into we negotiations with Sweden, Hungary, um, Netherlands, which we're in as well. And so we, we're starting to get a bit of a, uh, an international footprint. Um, but again, you should learn so much along the way. First of all, it's taken us nearly two years to get into Japan. And that is like pushing, 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 pushing. Um, that's been that's been an incredible eye opener in terms of bureaucracy and and um, process. Uh, the, the Europe is all well and fine, fantastic, four hundred forty million people. Ah, but they only you only allowed seven hundred more bottles in Europe, not seven fifty more bottles. So we had to change our bottles. We had to change our bottle prints, we had to change the boxes that they were in, we had to change the outer boxes they were in, we had to change all our labeling um, before we even made one sale uh, in Europe. And so these are things you, uh, you know, you, in hindsight, you think, hmm, if I'd known the problems we would have had, we we're going to have, I might not have actually gone that way. Um, but at the time, you just go, okay, well, let's do this. Okay, let's do this. And so you you kind of the hurdles don't come at you all at once. The obstacles are it's not a big wall. There's a little brick here. There's a little brick there, and you kind of jump them as you're going along. Um, and uh, it's only when you look back you realize how many bricks uh, you you have jumped. Um, and this is just a video I thought you might enjoy. Or I hope you enjoy. If it all play, so then.
thank you very much um and happy to take any any questions um so we've got oh mike sorry yes Oh, thank you, Leslie. That's absolutely fascinating. A very brave adventure that you and your wife have gone through, and we congratulate you on the success of it. Several of the points you make, I strongly agree with. Firstly, um, you know, that so many scientists are not very good at communicating their results and, and, and beneficiating their results. And it's great to see this, this very good example. And also, I've also noticed that in many top businessmen are ex-scientists who adopt a logical approach to, to solving problems and defining problems. And, uh, you know, I think it's something that needs to be remembered, that a scientific background can lead you in many different directions and can equip you well in other disciplines. Uh, we've had several questions from the chat box. One of them has already been answered, and that is what was the impact of the alcohol bans, and you, you've outlined that. Um, I'd like to ask a few other questions. Um, is there any difference in the, the different kinds of dung produced, for instance, by cows or bulls or juveniles or forest or savanna elephants in terms of the quality you need for your gin? So th that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, and that's one of the things that uh, we, th we think makes it so exciting is that um, the flavor of, of the gin is going to change depending on the season that the dung is collected uh, and the geographical location uh, from which we collect the dung because the botanicals available to the elephants to eat is, is going to be different. Uh, and so, in effect, we are going to, we're, we're expecting to have uh, vintages, I, I guess is the, the closest analogy, uh, of, of Englobu um, gin that will, will subtly differ depending on, on, on where and when the dung is collected. Apparently, you label the bottles in terms of where the dung was collected, so that gives information on, to people of where it's sourced from. That, that's right. So this is a, another layer to the story that we, we thought would be fun is that on the on the back of the bottles with the where the lot number is there's a, the G, um, GPS coordinates of the of the game reserve and, and the date in which the dung was collected so that you'd be able to see whether it was summer season spring season uh, and, and where in the country it, it was collected. It seems that weaving a story, not only into the making of your gin, but where it came from and the origin of your logo and, and, and diagrams and so on is a very important part of your whole success story. I, th I think stories are an important part of any success story, or uh, well, any success really, um, because that's what we live for really, people telling us stories, us telling people stories. You know, any, any, when you read the news, it's stories. When you speak to people, you relate stories. When you, so uh, most of our relationships with people and with, with objects uh, revolve around stories. Uh, and I think it's, it's a skill that's, that needs to be taught more, uh, is to become a good storyteller. Um, and because then people buy into whatever it is, buy into your product, buy into your idea, buy into your research. If you can weave a story around it, you will get people believing in it. It's interesting that in different ways, our careers have followed similar paths in that I was deeply involved in academia, in fish research and aquatic conservation, and then decided to go into public education of science and was education director at the Georgian's Aquarium. Um, and then I went into science centers, which whose whole focus is communicating science uh, to the public. And now in retirement, I'm 100% involved in writing popular science books. And in fact, I came across your work uh, while researching a book called Harambi, The Spirit of Innovation in Africa. And there are two pages about your <laughs> in Blue Virgin in, in that book, which is now in press for the Human Sciences Research Council. And that's how I heard of you and, and, and told SciFest about you. So it's, it's wonderful to make uh, this link. Another question, has indigenous knowledge played any role uh, in your research and in the development of your product? Indigenous knowledge in terms of, in terms of what, uh, Mike? About elephants, about their diets, and, and 
the symbolism of elephants. Obviously, the finger drawing of an elephant, Sulu sort of finger drawing, is your logo. So that that there's been an interaction there. So it's um, in terms of indigenous knowledge. That was again, it was a collection of stories, uh, or our our collecting of stories. Uh, I think is perhaps where that's where that comes in. So when we spoke to, um, you know, we spoke to woman from from Zimbabwe, and we'd say, oh, we make elephant dung gin, or and they were, oh yeah, well we use it for this, you know. So th th we started collecting stories ab about about where it was used, how it was used. Um, and so that's that's again that's one of the things we try and get across all, the, all these African stories about the elephant and then the importance of the actually in in, uh, in medicines and in, in traditional methods. What other uses is elephant dung being put to? We we use for tea. It's used for as a fuel for making fires and as compost. Uh, are, are there any foods that you know that are made from elephant dung? Uh, well, it's used for paper, I guess, is one as well. Um, it's used um, a, uh, in terms of um, medicines, in terms of sinus relief. Uh, it's in terms of food. I'm not sure. It's certainly used in building um, in uh, Malawi. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, one, it's one of those versatile products. I must say, uh, it was used. Yeah, that's in fact. There's uh, I think because you do you get elephant dung briquettes. I think. Um, for for brying is is one of the things that they've, uh, uh, they've developed. Have you given thought to making a non-alcoholic -al soft drink from elephant dung? We have. Um, we you know it's one of those. It is something certainly during lockdown to give a lot of thought to that sort of thing, um, um, and it may it may still come. Um, but again, it's one of those things that we we need to go back to the drawing board and say right how. How can we do this? What's the best way? If we're going to do this, what's the best way we can we can do this? Um, and and kind of on that note, so we when we looked at elephants in terms of uh, making elephant dung gin, we considered other um, other animals. So you know you look at the you think oh the the felt felt's full of them, but really based on the the digestion and the, the those sorts of criteria, there are only three animals you could really do. Uh, the elephant, the, the black rhino, and the, and the white rhino. Uh, and the white rhino only eats grass, so you might as well go and mow your lawn and take the and put it in the gym. It's not very exciting. Uh, and the black rhino eats uh, plants that are poisonous uh, for humans, which it's it's potentially possible to get around, but it, it would involve uh, funding a. We, well, we we try to work it out, but it probably involve funding a PhD studentship in order to look at looking at the toxicity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and also, um, rhinos are protective, so they create midden heaps, and so they're protective of their midden heap. And so we decided that it probably wouldn't be a great idea, or would be be more than our life's worth, is to try and uh, try <laughs> try and get some done from them. So is Mvubu gin from hippos not an option? I mean, their diet, diet is probably also very boring, um, just yes. essentially grass. And, um, and I think their dung might be more difficult to collect as well. Yeah, because they often defecate in the water after they've eaten on land. Yeah. That's correct, yeah. yeah. No, that's right. um, so you, you talked a little bit about your penetration of foreign markets. Uh, so that obviously has been impacted by the pandemic and travel and export restrictions. But you're confident of, for instance, getting into markets in the UK and Western Europe, USA? Uh, USA, we're not even going to look at because that is, well, I say we're not ever going to. We're certainly not going to in the foreseeable future. That is a, a disaster market to try and get into because each state has its own legislation and so even if you get into one state it doesn't mean you can get into other states and so it's <laughs> we decided we're going to park that for a very long time um but yes yeah, certainly western europe uh we we i think we're doing a good job of getting into it was, was easier before brexit um certainly england getting into the uk um but now we need to look at that and see again how we can because now we're in Europe, it doesn't now, of course, it means we're not in the UK, whereas before we were, um, which, is a, which is a pain. What do you 
think the main lessons are that other entrepreneurs can learn from the experience that you've gone through? I think one of the big things is don't just discard an idea, no matter how crazy it seems. If an idea comes, just give it time uh, and look at it. You don't have to do anything straight away, but don't dismiss it, uh, I think is, is, is what I would say. And then don't worry about ridicule. Um, you know, that's, that was, a, that was a, as I said in ours, you know, it's, it's a Marmite product. Ours. People, we tell people and they, they, our reaction, the reactions are either they love it or they hate it. Uh, and so I think you've got to be prepared to put yourself out there uh, and, you know, really have faith in, in if you believe in it, you've, you've got to go for it. And use the scientific method. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Are, are there any benefits of using the botanicals that have been collected and eaten by elephants compared to using the same botanicals that might have been collected by humans? No, I don't think so. I can't, I, I, I mean, I can't say definitively, um, but I, I don't think so. Um, other than it makes our life a lot easier because we only have to make one collection rather than go around to all the, all the, all the um, trees. Um, no, no, I, it's, it's not. It just, it's just more interesting. Have you been able to identify the different plant species that are in the dung that makes the different flavors of gin? So we can't, uh, we can't obviously can't identify every single one. Um, what we do do is we uh, we speak to the uh, game rangers uh, because they're very familiar with the elephants and what they eat, and we speak to them about the elephant's diet, um, and they they're able to to say just look, this is these are the, the these are the plants that the elephant browses on. They don't touch these if it's all. You know, or they, they, I say they don't touch these. Their, their diet does change depending on the, the, the availability of water as well. You know, if plants are dead or not, um, or, or there for them. So speaking to the speaking to the game rangers really has given us the greatest insight into what botanicals will be in the dung that we collect. You, you obviously use um, juniper as a flavorant. But what about the other typical um, flavorings such as coriander, cardamom, anise, cinnamon, rose, we lavender? Don't, we don't have. How many uh, of them uh, you use? We, we use, um, so we, we have a, we don't use cardamom or anise um, or um, lavender, but we use the, the angelica, the orris root, um, citrus is in there. Um, so we, we use. Some of the some of the basic or uh, well, some of the more traditional ones as well. And who are your main customers? Have you been able to determine that? Um, so tourists love it, um, and so we we've done very well in, in duty in the duty free. Well, certainly we were doing very well in duty free before uh, the whole COVID thing knocked it. Uh, although we got our first, uh, we got our first resupply order today from Duty Free, so it seems like things might be picking up. Hopefully, um, but remarkably, uh, it does extremely well actually. In uh, it's doing well in bottle stores as well. So even even the general, you know, in general consumption, uh, people are are enjoying it. Um, yeah, which is perhaps something not we, we hadn't considered on before because before we got a national distributor we focused very much on game lodges and uh the, the more of the tourist locations uh, and our distributor came and he goes no let's try and get this into you know so we're in tops and we're in macro and we're in a, a number of the larger uh retailers he said, let's just try and get these and see how it goes and it's, it's been remarkably uh, remarkably good yeah uh and in terms of africa we're, we're hopefully going to get into, we're speaking to someone in Kenya, we're in Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Namibia as well. So we're starting to, to get into those um, local African markets as well. And do you think the main selling point is the novelty of it, or is it the taste, or combination of both? We, well, we hope, and so one of the biggest selling points actually is that we give back to a wildlife conservation uh, and that and then again that's something that people buy into they feel part of something bigger so when you go and, and 
and enjoy the gin it's not oh it's just a gin you're enjoying you now you're involved in wildlife conservation so that's that's important i think for people um we also think the novelty initially is is very often you know someone will get it as a gift for someone else or oh this this is a bit different but we we trust that we have a good enough product that once someone's tasted it they will buy it again it's very interesting that your early contact was with roger jorgensen because you know my research has also revealed he was the original craft gin maker in south africa back in 2007 That's which right. is some you know six years before the craft gin boom took off and and when i completed my research in this field um in Cape Town alone, there were 280 different brands of craft gins being produced by 2019. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing boom, and uh, yeah, it's great that you're part of it. Yeah. Did you have any problems with the regulatory authorities in terms of health issues? And no, so we've we've uh, you know we did due diligence on it. So we sent we sent it into the laboratory for, for, for various testings in order to and, and that was off our own volition. That wasn't we weren't required to. Um, but no, we've we've not had um, any any problems with with that at all. Um, um, but but just going back to your your previous point about gin, you know the, the popularity of gin. I, I think it's it comes from the variety of gin that you can have. Um, it's not you know you look at rum and you look at brandy and whiskey and it, it's quite a limited flavor profile that you you can have whereas gin just seems to go from flowery to earthy to spicy you know so it, it, there's one for every everyone and, and you can you can enjoy it in summer of course you can have a nice citrusy gin with uh with the spritzer or uh, uh uh you know the the water or you can have it you can find gins that you can enjoy neat around a fire for winter or around, you know so the, the versatility of gin is i think is what's really driving the popularity now and, and how do you think things will change after the pandemic has passed do you think this craft gin and other craft products will continue to flourish or what's going to happen so that's a tough one i think i don't think we've seen the end of the attrition of um of distilleries going going under, um, you know, it's it's tough, and I think there will be <laughs> for the next several months, half a year, maybe even a year. Uh, I think we will see a, a decline in, in perhaps the, the the absolute numbers of of producers, um, which is it's, it's it's not great at all. Um, I think the the, the more vibrant uh the 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 genre the, the better for us um but we'll see I, I think maybe you know once things stabilize then you'll get people coming back into the markets as well so uh it is not over yet i think i think it's going to be a while before the, the it's all shaken out the tree certainly very many small and medium-sized enterprises have folded during the um pandemic and i think that'll you know, definitely impact the, the craft gin market as well. But let's hope the survivors thrive um, after that. You know, Ryan, uh, Cyphus has given us permission to go beyond seven o'clock, which is why I've, I've been carrying on. Uh, but do, can you, would you like to make any concluding comments to our audience? Um, I think the, uh, my, my biggest thing is, um, trust science and, and adopt a, a scientific approach in, in, in anything that you are exploring, uh, you know, any, any new ideas, anything that you come across, don't be, be, be skeptical uh, and, and be questioning and, and be scientific. And for me, those, those are principles that I think everyone should, everyone should learn and, and everyone should buy, uh, certainly abide by. Corollary to that is if you're an entrepreneur and you're planning to develop a business around a natural product, but you don't have a scientific background, then it's essential that you work with scientists, partner, partner with them, so that you can you know, benefit not only from their knowledge, but from the logical way they go about things. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, that's spot on. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure 
hearing your talk. It's very inspirational, fascinating, very brave. And congratulations um, uh, to, to, to you and to Paula. Fantastic, very African adventure you've been on. And I'm sure that all the CIFIS participants have greatly benefited from your example. Thank you very, very thank, much. Thank you very much for having me. It's been delightful. Bye-bye.